this is Scott McDonald of Dr. Demographics, and I'm feeling particularly bold today. I, I just noticed that the, uh, the glare that comes off my head on some days is like remarkable. And today is just one of those days I'm going to wear a hat. So let's keep the eyes down here. I mean, anyway, we don't have to look at the, eye, the head. So I often respond to questions that come from our viewers. And uh, today is such a topic. This very bright doctor wrote to me and said, so what's the real difference between Florida and Texas? I'd like to know where to look. I don't want to know what to investigate. What are the statistics telling us? What are the trends? And I'm going to get to that, but I want to kind of start with the idea that you need to understand that when you're looking at two very large geographic areas, like two growing states, it's not easy and it can be a little deceptive because you can look at numbers in the aggregate and it won't tell you what you want to know. And that's because practice areas are usually much smaller than the states. And I'll get to this in just a second. So I want to go through, though, Florida and Texas, both growing, both very dynamic. And in fact, if I were to guess, I would say that uh, our, at least one of our presidential candidates for the next year will come from one of these two states. And there's a lot in play as to what the success rate of each of the states has been, why they have grown, why they're growing, and places that are a little bit doomed. So stick with me for just a second. Let's get into this. Now, everybody already knows that Florida and Texas are two of the most successful states that we've had. They have a lot in common as to why they're doing well they also are very different, and I want you to understand how. So as a demographer, I want you to understand how I think and how my colleagues think in terms of locations that are good for practice and how to evaluate them. Now, the various U.S. states can be compared and contrasted by practice areas, uh, pardon me, but practice areas must be considered based upon local characteristics. And that's because a practice area usually has to be significantly smaller than a state, with the possible exception of Delaware and Rhode Island. So you're trying to figure out which is best, Florida or Texas, and what characteristics within a state make them desirable to go to. So I'm going to jump right into this because I think it's an interesting topic, and I want to thank our viewer for uh, recommending it. If you would like to propose a topic, please write to me at info at drdemographics.com. So let's compare states. There are several non-demographic factors to be taken into account when you're comparing these large geographic areas. So I'm going to give you just five to start. In terms of taxes, Florida and Texas have no state income tax. That is one huge reason why they are growing so quickly. So many people are saying, I've got to get out of these high tax states. The SALT, state and local taxes, are not tax deductible as they once were. And therefore, I don't want to stay in high tax states like New York and New Jersey. But what's more, Texas and Florida are actually reducing how much they're requesting, and they're becoming better places, safer places to establish a new practice. However, if you go to New York and New Jersey, it's a little iffy. It's a little, little higher risk. Now, I'm not saying that you can't make a good living in New York and New Jersey and other very large states. I am, however, saying that it's manifested these positive policies in increased uh, population. So, well, let's just go on and I'll tell you what I mean. The cost of living is a big difference. Now, when people say, why are you moving to this one place or another, they usually are not talking about the competition is much less in this one particular state. Usually they're saying things like the cost of living is, is a lot different. So California and Hawaii have a very expensive cost of living. They are not going to go down anytime soon. And in fact, there's a lot of imperative that the state legislatures and governors want the taxes to go up. But I have to say, there are other factors that are real, like employment, but in this case, weather. 
that makes these some states much more desirable to go to. And California and Hawaii have great weather. So that makes some people want to go there regardless of what the cost of living is, regardless of real estate or competition ratios. Competition ratios are a local issue. So as I say, how much saturation is there for endocrinologists or endodontists in a particular state? That should really be measured on the local level. And I mean by local level in an area that is defined by four to eight zip codes. The other side of a state may have very different competition ratios. So be careful of concluding, oh, the competition in this area is so bad, well, it's just saturated. You can't make a living there. You're really not looking at the whole state. You should be looking at that four to eight zip code area. So if somebody says, Scott, I want Dr. Demographics to do an analysis, we will usually say, let's take an area of at least eight, maybe to 14 zip codes and determine what the viability of the area might be based upon local competition rates. I hope that makes sense. Now, with that in mind, the economy and consumer patterns are strongly influenced by the demographics and growth. So some people will say, why is the cost of living going up? It's because the demand for housing is going up, but also state legislatures and governors have done things which make them much more prone to be a place where people want to or are accepting of a higher cost of living. Look, I used to live in California. I love California a lot. I love being able to get to the beach within about 20 minutes from my house where I grew up. That was great. But it may not be enough for you if you're thinking about putting your life savings at risk or finding a place long term where you can grow into more than one office. So therefore, you have to look at the economy and consumer patterns, and these will influence demographics and growth and other factors. I hope that makes sense as well. And look, there's another thing I want to bring up. We call it religiosity. Now, religiosity is a lifestyle characteristic. Some people say they want to go to a place where there are more people who go to church. Maybe you don't care, or maybe you want people to be of a particular religious denomination. So, for example, there are a lot of people who want to be around a large number of Catholics or Mormons or Baptists, or whatever. Religiosity not only is how many people are going to church, what percentage, but also what percentage and number of them are of a particular lifestyle persuasion. But religiosity is a lifestyle. It is not a thing that is determined by government fiat that will say, oh, well, people go here because the government is friendly toward religion. Usually there are other factors that are taken into account, and I'm using religiosity as an example. There are lots of other reasons why you want to move to one particular state or another. Religiosity just happens to be one of them. Now, I will say, as I'll mention again, religiosity has an impact that goes beyond what most people think. Now, you know that if a lot of people go to church, the crime rate is going to be lower the birth rate is going to be higher. It doesn't mean it's a cause and effect, but there is a correlation there, and it is something that demographers track. So if you're trying to find a population that you feel comfortable with, and maybe it's their political persuasion, like religiosity, it's a lifestyle characteristic that can say, yeah, this is the place for you or not. You could say, I want to find lots and lots of single people who want to get married. That is, like religiosity, a lifestyle characteristic, and you can know those places. You want to know what states are going to have more children or are more uh, popular to raise children? Well, for one reason, I mean, and that's why Tennessee, for example, has done so well. You know that there are three parts to Tennessee going from east to west. Let's just say there are three. I could recommend to you which of the third is going to be best for you based upon demographic characteristics that you most want. Now, the influences of birth rate, as I mentioned, are a factor that is 
highly dependent upon religiosity. In other words, there is no place in the United States that the number of children is increasing where people are not religiously inclined. This also, there is a correspondence, as I said, to the crime rates. It's not really a cause and effect, but there is a correlation that exists in a lifestyle that you can know so you can say, I want to go there because it's a place that I want to raise kids or I want my kids to go to school. Did you know that private schools are not evenly distributed around the United States or charter schools? Well, if you want to have your child attend a charter school, there are places that are going to be more beneficial for you to consider moving to. And believe it or not, it's not necessarily going to be one state that has lots of other professionals in it, where there may be a perceived saturation. I hope that also makes sense. So let me keep moving on. Are there any doomed states in the union? I bring this up now because if you look at the, the factors of what makes us a place doomed, I really am saying it's not growing. The population has negative characteristics. It's not what you want. And so in that way, there are states that are showing more challenges that are, in essence, doomed, and you ought to know what they are. Now, these are factors that influence growth, in other words, population growth specifically, and development, which is the creation of wealth. Did you know that there are some states that we know are going to do a lot better? People are going to want to move there. The demand for housing is going up. The cost of living is actually moderating. So these are factors that you want to know, but some people have different tastes and different desires. So I'm not saying you've got to be sticking to the influences, the factors that I say, but you want to know that there are factors that we can predict that will work for you. The quality of life causes are real, but they're difficult to predict over time. Now, I'm just saying this. Quality of life is a subjective measurement. It can be measured, however, if we define what the quality of life is. I'll bring up affordable housing. I'll bring up also low crime rates. If the cost quality of life is desirable based upon the criteria you want, ah, your goal, that's wonderful. But if it's not, no matter where you go, I don't care what practice might be for sale, you're going to be very in unhappy and seek to move as soon as possible. Now, I bring it up because we often have people who will move into an area and they'll say, you've got to get me out of here. This is just awful. I don't want to be here. Not because the practice that they purchased wasn't of great value or that the home they live in isn't great, but there are other quality of life factors that they need to take into account. And your demographer can know what they are in advance. That's why we talk about it first and foremost. Now, I'll bring up a couple of quality of life factors that are manifested by the policies of the politicians, meaning specifically governors and state legislatures. Crime and property value are two of them. But remember, these can change quickly, for better or for worse, as new players enter the picture. So I'll give you an example. California has recently passed a law in the whole state that you cannot zone for single-family homes, meaning, in other words, where before there was one home on a piece of property, and that was the limit on the number of residences there. Then they passed the legislation so that a single-family dwelling traditionally in that same space could now have four dwellings that are subdivided to live there. Now, that means people who have decided they want to have a single family home may not be able to have one based upon the zoning recommendations. Why have they done a thing like this, which may seem, seem pretty self destructive? Well, they're claiming that there's not enough room in California for all the demand for housing. But part of the reason is they've made it so that it is so expensive to build a single family dwelling that subdividing those properties is, well, kind of a rational thing to do. But the problem is a lot of people are saying, I don't want to have three neighbors in what used to be a land space for one family. I want to have more room. 
So a lot of people have said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to another option like in Nevada or Arizona or in Oregon or in Washington. I'm just saying that is how politicians have almost on a dime changed the desirability and the cost efficiency of putting a home in a particular area. We track those things all the time. Now, I want to talk to you about two locations that kind of show what the politicians have done, which has affected the desirability of the areas. Tennessee and Virginia are on the rise right now. Tennessee is, I don't want to say I just love Tennessee, but you know, the truth is I really do. I really like Tennessee. And for a long time, Virginia, particularly uh, Central and uh, Southern Virginia, were not doing that great. The state legislature and governor made some changes and they kind of went, yeah, let's do this. So a lot of people are moving in and building homes in both Tennessee and Virginia, and it's taken off very quickly in both. Now, not all parts of Tennessee and certainly not all parts of Virginia are doing as well, but we are able to predict where they are doing well. Now, by contrast, Arizona and New Mexico are falling. New Mexico has never been exceptionally good because of its employment base and because there was a large number of people who retired there. But Arizona was doing very, very well until a significant number of people from California moved there and changed the political outlook and political policies going on in Arizona. That's why they have Democrat senators, where traditionally it had been a Republican bastion. Now, I'm not trying to say that that's good or that's bad. I'm just saying it is a truth. And in a very short period of time, Arizona and New Mexico lowered the expectations for growth and for new employment. And that's affected where doctors want to set up. Now, yes, I, I have looked at all these areas. I know Scottsdale and Awatuki and I know all these places, and you have to look on the local level. But the states themselves have created policies that make them more or less desirable. Now, I want you to understand that no decline in a state is permanent and no rise in a state is permanent. Uh, places that we thought were going to do fantastic and just do well for the foreseeable future aren't necessarily doing well for the foreseeable future. There are things that change. It's a moving target out there, particularly if you're looking in a large geographic area like a state. Now, statewide trends in large states are difficult to predict. They're kind of hard to get a handle on because the large states have many trends within them that may make them not reflective of the rest of the state. So, for example, Texas has got uh, what's going on in greater Houston. It used to be one thing, now it's different, and it's going against statewide trends. States remain or contained very and separated markets. And sometimes the differences between the markets can be great. And I bring up Houston versus Dallas, but more important, Houston versus Austin. I'll get to that in just a second, but I'll only say the states have smaller markets that have to be taken into account. It's dangerous to say, oh, well, the whole state is this way, because it may not be that way in the whole state. The exception to that might be California, in which the state legislature has been so demanding of what people do on a local level, it's created trends that are following a state mandate. Now, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So if you look at parts of Florida, Jacksonville, it's not the same thing as Tampa. But look, I like both areas, don't get me wrong, but they're not the same. And I'll explain how they're different in just a second. Demographic character of the markets can be vastly different within the same state. So if you look at, at Tampa and Jacksonville, if you look at Miami, if you look at St. Augustine or Pompano Beach, they're different than they were. And they're different from each other because the local characteristics are very different. Now, let me give you three examples of what I'm talking about. Houston and San Antonio are not that far apart in Texas. And yet demographically and in terms of lifestyle and how the state legislatures are operating and 
more importantly, the county commissions, they're really, really different in Houston and in San Antonio. The people come from different places. The economy is different. The mandates they have on their lives and what makes a good quality of life are different in Houston and San Antonio. I like both areas, but I'm going to say there are parts of Houston, for example, that are really great for young families and another parts that are only for retirees, but they're very different from each other based upon that local phenomenon I discussed. San Diego and Los Angeles are close to each other. I mean, they're contiguous counties. Uh, well, kind of. There's Orange County in between. But San Diego has a very different lifestyle. And the reason people move to San Diego is different than why they move to Los Angeles, where they come from, what they consider a reasonable quality of life. Now, San Diego, as an example, has three distinct parts, the North County, the Downtown, and the East County. There is no West County in San Diego. That's the ocean. But I won't digress. The point is, what works in one part of San Diego is not working in another, and it's certainly true in Los Angeles. But if you're contrasting Los Angeles and San Diego counties, well, you've got very big differences in language and lifestyle, economy, hiring trends, employment, and you need to know those in order to make the decisions on where to practice. I will say the same thing's true in New York. If you go upstate, Albany and Rochester are not really that far apart, but boy, they're different. They're different in their economies and housing and employment and other factors. And so you want to know the characteristics of these individual markets as much as you want to understand the differences between the states. That's my point. Now, moving on, let's keep going on this Florida versus Texas thing. I'm going to create a little bit of a contrast. Now, they're very similar in some ways, and outwardly, you can say, oh, yeah, they're just the same. I am just ought to tell you this. I've traveled to Florida and Texas several times this year alone, and the changes in the post-pandemic world in each area is pretty big. So it's not a set thing. It's, it's a moving target. Now, they're both large southern states. They are both growing and very well, may I point out. They were formerly Democrat states. And some people forget Florida and Texas were solid blue states. But that has changed. So they're now red states. They both have big Hispanic, Spanish language populations. And that makes them desirable because the Hispanic population in this part of the country is going up. But they're not the same. Hang on. Tourism and agriculture sectors with an urban component are what make Florida and Texas similar. They both have that. But there are things that make them really different. And one of those is the countries and cultures of origin are very different. Florida has a, a significant Caribbean influence, Cuban population, South American, Argentinian, and even Europeans have moved to Florida. Texas doesn't have very many Europeans. It's primarily Mexican and Central American who've moved up here. Now, they speak Spanish, but their cultures are different. And anybody who knows the difference between a Chicano and a Guanaco, yeah, well, look, they're different. The sources of the residents are also different, not just in the terms of their cultures. Now, people who move to Florida from different parts of the United States. And as you may know, New York and New Jersey have provided a lot of people who've moved here to Florida. In Texas, not so much. They're primarily from the Western United States, Central United States, and even North Central the United States. So people have moved from different places and they bring with them their cultures and their political persuasions. The Suburban and urban structures are different. They're, you know, look, there are parts of Southern Florida, like Miami, that are very urban. And yes, there is an urban component up and down the coast on the east and west side of Florida, but they're not quite like the suburban urban distribution in Texas. So you've got Dallas and Fort Worth and the area between the two, which is very different. 
knowing the urban and suburban structures really will help you to know where you want to go. The legislative calendars, by the way, in each is different. You know that Florida has a year-round legislature. Florida, well, they meet every few months. And therefore, the amount of legislation they pass in Texas is much more than it is in Florida. The economies are also quite different. Yeah, yeah, there is tourism and there's agriculture. I get that. But there are also rising international economies and employment that are affecting each state and very differently. I'll keep going. Now, let's just get through some numbers. In Florida, the median household income is $66,108. In Texas, it's $70,608. That means, believe it or not, that Texas actually has a higher median household income. It also has, Texas does, a younger population. Median age, 35.1. Florida has 43 is the median age. Now, that does not show you that Florida has so many more retirees that are highly localized, and that will affect practices. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad, but you've got to know what the median age distribution is in each. You want kids? Florida's all right. Texas is going to be better. Now, the forecast growth, and this is over the next five years, Florida has a smaller projected population, 1.71. In Texas, it's actually higher. And I believe that the number 2.73 for the forecast is much lower than it really is. There are so many people moving to Texas, but both Florida and Texas are just killing all the other states in terms of how much they're growing. The population in Florida is 28% white and 35% uh, in Texas. What's deceptive about that is how you define white. Is Hispanic white? Remember, a culture is not a race. An ethnicity, like being Hispanic, is not simply defined. Florida has an extremely large senior population, much younger families in Texas. But you've got to understand that eight zip code area to really say definitively, does this area have a lot of younger families? Are there lots and lots of kids here? That's defined not by the whole state, but rather by the local manifestation of where the people are living. I hope that all makes sense too. Now, the real potential in the markets, Tampa versus Miami, each one has great potential. Dallas and Austin, great growth, great potential. Jacksonville and Orlando, there is real potential in each of these markets, but it's not the same kind of potential that's what I'm getting at. So you could move to Jacksonville, and it's only a couple hours away to be in Orlando, but they're different people. The same thing's true of Dallas and Austin. They're not geographically distant, but the potential of the market is different. Same thing with Tampa and Miami. Not super far away, but in character, they're different. That's why Dr. Demographics can explain to you why it is one area might be better for you and not better for everybody. To find Dr. Demographics, I want you to go to, yeah, the website, www.drdemographics, or write to us at info at drdemographics.com. Give us a call, 833-424-6222. Now, I wanted to say one last thing. I'm traveling a lot these days to address general membership meetings and sales conferences. Everybody wants to get an idea of what's happening in the long-term trends, especially in my area. If you would like me to put together a bid on having me come out and speak, write to me at info at drdemographics.com, and I'll be happy to put a bid together to say how much it'll cost to have me come out and explain all this and to predict the future of your area. We can talk to a general membership meeting or sales conference to give you an idea of what's likely to happen in the future. I want to thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking to you in the future. This is Scott McDonald. Bye-bye.